Welcome to the Female VC Lab podcast. I have Mary here. Mary, in one line, give me your name, your title, and the name of your organization. I'm actually Mary Ellen Iskandarian. Okay. I'm the president and CEO of Women's World Banking. Wonderful. How did Women's World Banking come about and how did you get involved with the Women's World Bank? So it's, it's actually a great story. We're one of a, a bunch of really iconic women's organizations that grew out of the first UN conference on human rights for women in Mexico City in 1976. And oh, wow. women literally from all over the world came together and realized that human rights for women would never be fully actualized if they also didn't have economic rights. And this was at a time where I always find it so amazing that there were American women alongside Indian women, alongside alongside African women, none of whom were allowed to own a credit card in their own name or take out a loan without their husband's signature and like all of these rights that they themselves like didn't have. And they were advocating so beautifully, so forcefully for universal access to, to finance. So three years later, the organization was formally created. We were actually created in the Netherlands. And oh, wow. yeah, the Dutch government was a huge early supporter and then brought on a number of other government supporters, the Swiss, the Norwegians, the Canadians. And we've always been very fortunate to have sort of government support. But from the very start, we've been about making sure that all women, including low-income women, had access to the full range of financial services, not just microloans at very high interest rates that mm -hmm. may be indebting them more than they were helping them. And when I joined the organization in 2006, it was very focused, almost like a membership organization on serving microfinance institutions so that they could serve women customers. But I joined almost at the exact same time that M-Pesa, which yes. is the first digital currency, was taking off. And it became so clear to me that was going to be the mechanism that we were going to reach that last mile, that low-income population through the cell phone with digital financial services. And honestly, the microfinance industry was really slow to adapt. Whereas others, like the cell phone companies themselves, mm -hmm. banks, growing numbers of fintechs became quite interested in that model. And so we really expanded and today are working with 74 financial service providers, all of the above, 30% of our partners are, are fintechs, insurance companies, neobanks, the whole range. And we help them design and offer financial services to low-income women how to market them. We've got a really great sort of program going in building women agents because we're seeing that women oh, wow. are incredibly effective in selling financial services to both men and women. They build a, a trust in a different, deeper way than men agents often do. Mm -hmm. We have a big policy advocacy platform, but we decided about a little over a decade ago, 12 years ago, that we needed to put our money where our mission is. And so- okay hardest money I've ever raised in my life, but we raised a $50 million private equity fund to take stakes in financial service providers who wanted to serve the low-income population. But it seemed as we were looking at the landscape, the minute you moved from that do-good nonprofit model, even if you were really successful, very profitable in that nonprofit realm, the, soon, the minute you brought in external shareholders, you started taking on regulatory compliance, all of that stuff. Somehow your client base shifted very much towards men. And if your leadership, even maybe even more importantly, had a woman CEO or a woman board chair, they were gone within four years of the institution oh, wow. changing. And so we wanted to be that investor that continued to support that business model that focused on women customers. Women are great customers for financial service providers and did so through gender diverse organizations. We, in, a, in an environment where we were seeing more than 20% 
decline in women customers, as I say, within four years of taking on new shareholders, we've had over a hundred percent increase in women clients since the moment of our investment to our exit in that first portfolio wow. of women companies. We've raised a second $103 million fund that we're still in the investment stage. I think the portfolio is a little more interesting. It's got some fintechs. It has a couple of companies that are referred to as being in the mobility space. So they're providing yes. two-wheeler vehicles mm -hmm. to women in rural areas. Interestingly, one of the companies we're an investor in in India is seeing twice a much higher, as much as twice as much take up of the electric vehicle by women than by men. So not only doing the right thing, but having this new market really dominated by women customers. We've got an affordable housing finance co company that requires the woman's name to be on the property title that's being financed. All of these business models do very specific things to attract women customers. We help them. We have a whole set of value creation activities we do to make sure that they're serving that market as, as broadly and as well as possible. But we also work on the gender diversity within the organization. Wow. So awesome. Thanks. So how do you think what you're doing at the Women's World Banking will impact venture capital or be an enhancement or addition to venture capital? First of all, great question. And thank you because our funds, we've got $153 million assets under management. We're going to be launching our third fund in Q3 that we hope to be even larger than that. But even that, which perfectly respectable sized funds, my hope is that our investment thesis, the value that we're unlocking for these companies is such that others start to emulate us and start to follow us and more capital comes into that into that space. I think one of the big differentiators for us that we are trying to shape to, in direct answer to your question is I think so much of what is considered gender lens investing mm -hmm. has become more almost more narrowed into investing in women-led companies. And nothing wrong with that. It's appalling. You've all heard the numbers. Less than there are percent. We all yeah, know the numbers. So I am in no way saying, and we have more than half of our portfolio are women-led companies. Yes. But we're agnostic going in about mm -hmm. the the ownership or the founder, as long as they are open to gender diversity, that they see the yes. business case for gender diversity and open to expanding their client base. And I'm happy to say we've fought our way into two deals now, one in South Africa, one in Kenya, that were like really hard to get into. They were oversubscribed where the founder said, and in both cases, they, they were men in, in both cases, no, we've really messed up entering the women's market. We thought we just needed a pink product that, you know. <laughs> yeah, like a pink product. And, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it and looked pretty. Yeah, pink it looked nice. attached to it, exactly. And With some really nice smells it. or something. Exactly. <laughs> we realized we don't know how to do this. We want a shareholder who knows how to help us tap into that market. So I think we're demonstrating that there is an investment thesis. We're showing yeah. the way. I'd say with our second fund, we've been able to lead more deals than we had with the first. That's and so good. when we put something in a deal term sheet, like three women in the C-suite by the third year or the CEO doesn't get the bonus, we know it's not just us banging the table saying this, it's the whole series B. Well, everyone has to agree with that. That, that comes in and supports us on that. And it's mm -hmm. it's so gratifying when we're not on the compensation committee of a board and we hear that the compensation committee decided to really challenge the CEO until he or she sometimes closed the the pay gap or made sure that that per, that woman was added to the C-suite. So it's been really gratifying to see the, the mindset the we were able to drive. Okay, follow up on what you just said, Mary Ellen. Do you see, you say we see a shift. So when you see the progression, maybe six months later, some of your recommendations actually were followed. Do you see a shift in actual where the company's trajectory is going? 
So six months can be a little. A, it's a, a little, little short. Fast. Okay. It's it's like a little a, fast. Let's say it's a year later. Yeah, I, but yeah, if you give me a year, I and I'll tell you, I'll tell you where we see the shifts. Yes. We have really strong correlations. I'm not a, I'm not a statistician, but I know a regression line that just is yes. right through a plot of points. We see a really strong correlation between more women on the staff and not just in the senior positions, but throughout the ranks of a financial service provider and more women. And mm -hmm. so that correlation exists, but more importantly, you're bringing more women customers in. You are seeing for financial service providers, which is our sweet spot, faster portfolio growth, higher returns on equity, yeah. Client retention through the roof. We see some really stark differences between client retention and women clients and male clients. And as we know, it's so much more expensive to have to go out and acquire that. Yeah, keep people. keep reacquiring people or exactly. get new people. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you give me that, you know, that six months to a year, I can show you solid business results by virtue That's of awesome. implementing some of our recommendations and the, and all those stats prove out as well i've seen those stats as well increase revenue faster exit bigger exit so all those stats are tracking as well thank you for that mary ellen so what are you currently reading or learning or listening to these days i'm not allowed to say anything that might sound like marketing of our third fund but we the no dimension, <laughs> don't do that <laughs> dimension that we're going to be adding this time is a climate dimension and okay, climate. from a couple of different perspectives i i'm never going to be in a an expert in you know energy transition finance but what i i am seeing real opportunities is product development there are women particularly in rural areas who are on the front lines of climate change dealing with yes. this they want access to the adaptive technology. We've got women farmers looking for solar irrigation pumps, for looking for that technology, mm -hmm. and nobody's lending to them. So we're seeing real That's opportunity for product development. We're also seeing, and this is the question of what I'm reading, I've just been really fascinated by two things. One is the research that's showing, even in the developed world, developed listed companies, when you have critical mass of women leadership, you're seeing better carbon footprints to real change within the corporate environment on what the, that company is doing to reduce its carbon emissions. Very strong differences between men's leadership and women's leadership. Yeah. The other thing that I've, I've been fascinated by is the number of countries, and I'd say it, it does skew more to the developing world than not, as they're presenting their plans into COP and yeah. what their climate planning is, mm -hmm. they're building in a whole range of women's empowerment goals, mm -hmm. some of which have nothing like on on the face to do with climate, but they're looking but they do. at women's leadership, women's education, making sure that women have access to finance. So those countries are seeing very strong linkages to women's economic participation and improved resilience and response to climate. And I've just been, this, I'm new to that space. And so I'm reading everything I can on that literature. And it's really fascinating. There's a lot, there's a lot of good literature out in, about that space. And even if you look at the UN, clearly the UN has a lot of things, yeah. but it's interesting. Some of the SDGs are women related and they're yeah. also related to let's bring people out of poverty. If you are in, like you said, a rural farmer, I'm not saying you're impoverished, right? You have some economic capability, right. <laughs> but then if you add on the technological pieces, like you said, that maybe some people here have, or some of the other climate thinking, or maybe they have climate thinking and it's, look, if you do it this way, it'll actually reduce that, right? The combinations of those things can be very powerful. And it's interesting because if you think about voices and who's directly impacted by these things versus I'm not farming anything, I'm just going to the store. So I'm indirectly impacted. But if you're farming something that's directly impacting you from a climate perspective, those voices need to be heard and amplified because they are dealing with it on a Absolutely. daily basis. 
Absolutely. And to think that we could come up with a solution that's not taking that lived experience into consideration is really nuts. That, that is really crazy. Not the best product development. Uh, <laughs> Aaron. All right. Bonus question. We uh -oh. have time for it, Mary Ellen. In two years, how do you see what you're doing changing or evolving? Ooh, great question. All right, so taking a little bit of a step back, when we started to see the kind of impact we were having as an investor sitting at the board table, and not to denigrate what I'm doing on my NGO work, but this is real lasting impact. We've had some really good exits where when we've sold an investment, the buyer said, we are buying this because we really like this strategy and want to continue it. So we have devoted quite a bit of time to how do we build out the asset management strategy? How do we build out this business? And everybody told us, until you have a real path to a billion AUM, nobody's really going to take you seriously. I am on that path now. So I think within two years, I'm going to be able to come back on your program and tell you about my, my billion AUM, my market rate returns, and my at least three funds under management. Those were the things that I was told I needed. And then what I'd love to think about doing is, do we expand the model a little bit? Do I become a, a, a seeder of women managers? Do I somehow become a platform to expand our vision of gender lens investing, which is includes women founded companies, but maybe it has a greater appreciation of that end client and the value of the woman customer. So that's where I'd like to be in two years is really growing this business even beyond the funds that I currently have under management. Oh, and, and that's great. And if you think about it, Mary Ellen, those tr like you're creating this massive ecosystem, right? You have your women founders, you have your fund, clearly you're a woman. And then you have the exits. So you're creating the next set of people, right? And so now they have some maybe personal wealth. So then how do they potentially become LPs in someone's right. fund? Or how do they potentially invest back or become investors into something else? So if you think about that ecosystem portion of what you're discussing, all of that helps create the wealth amongst everyone in the ecosystem and it slightly helps with that two percent number <laughs> you know, that's a big number that's a big number to overcome but if you create more of those kind of ecosystems and give them education and i think like what you said about the women's education and the empowerment and the education if you're getting exits now what do you do you can just go off to a beach and retire. They may be young. They may not want to do that. So now, what does the next phase of your life look like? Great. I, we have a woman founder. It's an embedded finance company in, in Kenya. And she's a serial entrepreneur, amazing woman. She'll send her to you to be on your program. She's really Would love great. that. And she always, she always says, us women founders are maybe a little over-mentored and a little under-invested. <laughs> so That's she's, true. She's been really committed to putting her wealth back into other women's back business. in. That's I, right. I admire that so much and not just admire it. It really is the ecosystem that we're trying to build. You're absolutely Correct. right. I think that's very important. Otherwise, that 2% is not going to move too much. Exactly. How do people contact you? Either directly, I'm MEI at womensworldbanking.org, but do check out that website, womensworldbanking.org. We've got all of our global activities on the NGO, and then there's a dedicated page for our asset management activities. And we've got write ups on all of our portfolio companies and our fantastic team. So that's womensworldbanking, no apostrophe, all one word, dot org. And we'll make sure that's in the show notes. Thank you. So thank you so very much. Mary Ellen Eskandarian from the Women's World Banking Capital Partners Funds 1 and 2 or the Women's World 